So now, it's my very great pleasure uh, to introduce the next speaker to tell you about um, his book, a man who uh, is much loved for lots of good reasons, and he will demonstrate them, I'm sure, in a, in a minute. He's also knighted by, what is it? Canada. By Canada, yes. <laughs> I've heard of it. What, I, can I tell you my Canadian joke? Are there many Canadians in the audience? <laughs> Yay, oops. Okay, how do you get a, 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 a swimming pool full of Canadians to get out of the pool at a pool party? You go, excuse me, could you get out of the pool, please? <laughs> Thank you. Martin Short, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how humble your applause makes a huge comedic icon like myself feel. Thank you. <laughs> please be seated. Thanks. It is an absolute thrill to be here uh, this morning. It's actually more than a thrill, it's an obligation. <laughs> and um, <laughs> even though I wasn't BEA's first choice uh, as someone to speak today, it doesn't really bother me because Gary Busey is such a different type. So. <laughs> but there's no greater high than speaking to an audience at 8.26 in the morning. <laughs> I'm just getting in, so I don't know how about you. And now, there is no greater high. The only difference between you people and pure-grade pharmaceutical morphine is that morphine doesn't judge. So I'll speed it along. I want on this panel to be uh, with the, the brilliant Lena Dunham. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to the astounding Combe Toybean, who knows my uncle, Patty, in Cross with Glen Count Armagh. We discussed that earlier. And the genius and the breathtakingly pale Alan Cummings. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was pale, but you know, we, he just, uh, even Donald Sterling would tell him to get some color, you know. Uh, <laughs> That one looks like a coloring book that hasn't been colored yet. You know? <laughs> and Donald Sterling, we won't get on to him, you know. Although I did have dinner with him once and he told me that uh, 12 Years a Slave was his, he called it the feel good movie of the year. So he's an interesting. Um, I am, I am, uh, first of all, you look fantastic. This is, what a beautiful looking. Are you all wearing Spanx? You just. <laughs> Very nice. Um, I, uh, I, my, my book is entitled, I Must Say, My Life as a Humble Comedy Legend. And, and uh, I, it is a sincere memoir, uh, if I do say so myself, of, a, of, I think, a fascinating life. But of course, it will be determined by those who read it. Um, and there, there are things that... You, I think I'm very honest in this book because I don't know how you write a book if you're not honest. I think you have to show the entire journey. Uh, many things about me that people probably already know. I'm Canadian, you know. Are we at war? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't. We're the aliens you don't deport, remember. Um, I'm 64 years of age. No work, absolutely no work. It's just, this is the natural face. Because cosmetic surgery, particularly on a man, does not, you get that look. And no one says, who's that hot looking 38 year old dude? <laughs> <coughs> no, they don't say that. They say, who's the 64 year old who's been in a fire? That's what they said. <laughs> I have three Tony Awards. Thank you. 
although two of them are daytime Tonys, but I count them. <laughs> My first love has always been the theater, uh, followed by the movies, and then television, and then my family. Um, <laughs> I actually have three children, uh, one of each, and I, I find that... <laughs> my first movie is The Three Amigos. I did Saturday Night Live, and I got asked to be my first movie with the, uh, with the brilliant Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and, uh, and I think it's, it's safe to say that Steve Martin is a genius. Uh, not particularly true, but safe. Um, <laughs> I adore Steve. He, you know what's great about Steve? Um, when I think of Steve, and it's not often, but when I think of him, <laughs> I realize that of all the attributes that he, he you know, he's a composer and, and, and a, a writer and a, and a brilliant comedian, but I think the thing that I admire about him most is he's not afraid to hit someone else's kid. And I think that that, <laughs> you've got to admire that. And he's pale. I mean, you know, he, he once got a sunburn from his Kindle reader. This is a very... <laughs> I grew up in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, uh, in a house filled with love in that our cousin lived with us and she put out. And so... <laughs> too revealing? Am I being too revealing? <laughs> and I adored my parents. God rest her soul. Especially my mom. She's not dead yet, but she's not looking good. It's not looking good. My father was Irish, you know. He's from Cross McGlenn, County Armagh, and... Uh, you know, he, he wasn't afraid to take a drink. And, uh, you know, the, used to, and I used to say, Dad, why make that noise? Just drink the gin. I don't. <laughs> he started around, uh, on weekends, he'd start around 7 in the morning. Gin and ginger, no ice. But only in the weekends and on holidays and after work. And so... <laughs> He would, I, I, a friend of mine was uh, Mitchell Rosenblatt, and his, he, was, uh, he said to my father one time, he said, you know, Mr. Short, um, I'm half Irish and half Jewish. And my father said, you know, Mitchell, there's a, uh, in Cross McGlenn, Armagh, we had an expression for someone who is indeed half Irish and half Jewish. We call them a Jew. Um, I think characters, uh, which I explore uh, very much so in, in uh, I Must Say, My Life is a Humble Comedy Legend, <laughs> rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, but I do explore the development of characters. My father is a character that it came from observing um, human behavior. Uh, the character I developed in uh, SCTV and Saturday Night, Ed Grimley was a character, uh, thank you, no, no, I kid. Uh, no, uh, the, uh, the thanks for remembering. Um, no, it was a uh, there was a there was a, a kid in high school uh, named Paul Michnik, and he used to his voice always went up like that. He always talked like that. He wanted to be a photographer. <laughs> I'd say, hey, Mitchell, uh, uh, Paul, did you uh, take any uh, photos this weekend? I took a lot of slides. But um, I didn't feel I had to develop them because, like, I took them. And you kind of go, hmm, I think I'll remember that rhythm and make millions later. <laughs> the character Jiminy Gleckworth based on a man who lived in our street, Mr. Braden. And his voice would go very high and very low. And he, if you stayed off his lawn for a whole year, you'd get to go to the movies because they own a movie theater. And uh, then, you know, later on, you develop him as a character who can ask anybody anything. Uh, Jiminy Glick once said to Mel Brooks, what's your big beef with the Nazis? <laughs> Why 
When I was doing Saturday Night Live, there was a makeup artist. She was the most uh, defensive person I'd ever met in my life. Uh, her name was Isabel Steubing, and uh, she, was, uh, she would chain smoke. You could smoke inside in 84, and she'd, you'd sit in her makeup chair, and you'd say, gee, Isabel, I look a little... I, I look a little pale, don't I? She said, I know that. You don't think I know that? I know that. I'm a makeup artist. I wouldn't know that. <laughs> Sorry. Just thought I'd mention it. So, um, but a month into doing that show, uh, Billy Crystal and Christopher Guest and I were writing a piece, uh, satirizing 60 Minutes, and uh, I didn't, I was going to play the defensive lawyer, the person defending the bad guy, you know, that Mike Wallace would always cross-examine, and I didn't know who to do, and Billy Crystal said, why don't you do Isabel Steubing? <laughs> you do her behind her back all the time anyway. <laughs> why don't you do it uh, today? And I said, yeah, but I'll get caught out. Now she'll never know. They never know, he said. They never find out. So I did it. And, uh, but what I forgot, as I'm sitting behind a desk playing the defensive lawyer, Nathan Thurm, I named him, uh, being cross-examined by Harry Shearer, who was playing Mike Wallace. I forgot that Isabel, of course, would be there because she was the makeup artist. So, um, Mike Wallace is saying, so did you know that your client was involved? I'd say, I know that. You don't think I know that? I'm a lawyer. I would know that. The director would say, cut, he's sweating. And Isabel would say, I know that. You don't think I know that? I can see that. <laughs> it was insane. And every time I would do the character, I would be terrified I was going to get caught, and I never got caught. And uh, then on the last uh, show, there was a big uh, closing party, and her assistant got drunk, and he went into her office and said, Isabel, how stupid are you? Don't you know you're Nathan Thurm? And she was devastated, and she confronted me, you know, and she said, I thought you were my friend. And I said, Isabel, I am your friend, but you know that impersonation is the highest form of compliment. <laughs> and she said, I know that. You don't think I know that? I don't know. I deal with a lot of um, subjects, a lot of funny stories, a lot of funny journeys. I've had, my natural orientation is to be happy. And um, I think what makes this book interesting to me is that um, I've had situations that could have made someone not happy. Um, when I was 12, my brother David died in a car accident. When I was 17, my mother died of cancer. When I was 20, my father died of a stroke. And, um, and then for the next 40 years, I had pure joy, pure bliss, happy, a fascinating up and down career, but all careers are up and down. And that's what made it interesting. Fabulous marriage, three great children. And then um, when I was 60, my, my uh, wife developed ovarian cancer and died. Uh, and so I thought, I don't think I would have written a book had that not happened because it dawned on me that I, I became an orphan at 20 and a widower at 60 and in between this fabulous life and then after that what do you do except you either become defeated and crushed or you become empowered you know I had never been particularly, oh, I'm Canadian again, so I'm, we're kind of closed about our emotions. You know, we keep it. I, the only thing I would ever say about my marriages was the secret to a Hollywood marriage was to be um, uh, sensitive to your wife's needs and make sure your personal assistant fulfills them. And that's about <laughs> as deep as I'd go, you know. But um, I realized that I now had a book. I now had the idea of a book a book about you have to pick yourself up, you have to figure, you can't be, there's a yin for a yang. A horrible situation in your life can also empower you and teach you a life lesson that no one else uh, could have taught you and you couldn't have realized. So um, I think this book is all things and I thank you all 
for being here and potentially helping to get um, the people to, to read this book. I think it's, I think it's um, going to be interesting because I think it's going to be a little less ex um, what one might expect. And I think it's also powerful for its honesty. Um, I want to thank Harper's and Kathy Schneider and David Hershey here. Um, I have a collaborator in this book, a brilliant, brilliant young man, one of the great souls that I've been happy to experience in my life, David Camp, who's out there. Thank you, David. And last but not least, I do hope that you will, uh, upon reading, I must say, my life as a humble comedy legend, <laughs> you will be left with one thought, which is, it's better to have loved a short than never to have loved at all. Thank you so much. <laughs>